moving on to the MBTA's Communities Act. A couple of weeks ago in the Ordinance and Rules, uh, Attorney Azadi uh, spoke on uh, where we're at with the MBTA's Communities Act. We thought it would be good to talk a little bit about that. Um, and Tom is here to chat about that. Yeah, so I'm going to segue into this just by discussing a bit further, like the reasons for um, like voting against the budget, why I think it's a good thing, which is just because like the government currently is like very um, emaciated. A lot of like services aren't being fully funded that Colleen pointed out wonderfully in her reasons for voting against. One of those things is the planning department, which helps to coordinate how like streets and all the different developments in Waltham synergize together to become a functioning city. Uh, and recently we had our head planner retire. Uh, and because of that, like the planning department is so emaciated that we have attorney Azadi who, you know, has no expertise uh, in planning. And she's the first to acknowledge that, like this isn't a, this isn't a not good cert. Like she knows that she is not a planner and a planner should be doing this. But our planning department is so small for like a whole city of 60,000 plus people that one person retiring and suddenly this huge task of complying with the MBTA Communities Act is shifted to the law department for some goddamn reason. Um, so that's a bit ridiculous. And that's led to just a lot of like confusion with how the MBTA Communities Act is to be complied with at all. Um, which brings us to the city council meeting earlier this month where attorney Zadi was in to talk about like how Waltham can comply with the MBTA Communities Act. And what this law does, it requires that Waltham legalizes around 4,000 homes near transit, half of which has to be within a half mile of a commuter rail station, the other half of which can be anywhere. Um, yeah, and which has to be at a density of at least 15 units per acre. So we just need dense housing near transit. We need to legalize it. That's what this law is. And Azadi was opining them just like, you know, what she's learned and what she's been able to figure out with the law department in the past few months of trying to figure out how Waltham can comply with this law. Um, so I have a couple of things to say about what she said, just like points of clarification. Um, but first I would like to address that something that keeps on coming up is like people, city councilors are not in the NBTA Communities Act for not requiring affordability. And then Azadi keeps on repeating the statement that the Communities Act even limits the amount of affordability that is allowed to be included in new developments with the NBTA Communities Act. It's limited at 10%. This is not totally true. Um, so I'll just screen share just to show Oh, what I mean by that. So this is from the Massachusetts, um, is from mass.gov on their, from their webpage, which describes the MBTA Community Act. This document is their guidelines for it. And this outlines the affordability, which is permitted in the MBTA Communities Act, um, which is that within, up, within zoned area for the MBTA Communities Act, all the development can have a, maximum of 10% affordability requirements and only a certain degree of affordability. Unless Waltham conducts a study which says like, hey, it can be feasibly built if we create more affordable housing than this. In which case we can go up to 20% affordable with any depth to like how affordable that housing is. So this is just something that keeps on getting left out of the conversation. So I just wanna make sure it is included so people know. Currently, Waltham has a, an inclusionary zoning ordinance, which just means for any dense development, 20% of its units will be allowed to be made affordable. This can still be the case after the MB Taking Use Law, um, or when we implement the MB Taking Use Law. Whenever we legalize 4,000 units of housing, we will also in turn be legalizing potentially 800 units of affordable housing which will be massive for affordability in Waltham. That is more affordable housing than Waltham has created in the past like 30 years cumulatively. It is a lot of potential affordable housing on the horizon. And the fact that it keeps on getting skipped over and people are saying like, oh no, this the MBT Communities Act is actually like restricts how much affordable housing can build is like strictly false on the service, but also like digging deeper. Like the only requirement is that we 
do a study that says it's feasibly feasible to be produced. And, um, you know, if our current inclusionary zoning ordinance isn't feasible, then it's useless anyway. Uh, Cause that's actually a big problem currently. Um, our current inclusionary zoning ordinance allows for 20% of any development to be affordable housing. It has never once been used to create affordable housing in the city of Waltham in the past few years. Um, because, um, I mean, there are a lot of reasons. Primarily that it's just illegal to build into housing most of Waltham. Uh, but secondarily, we recently discussed a condo development where um, the the developer of the church and the condos chose to just like pay a lump sum instead of doing the affordability requirements just because that's what was feasible for them. So, yeah, that's the first point. Um, secondly, I just like to discuss the difficulty of complying with this law because Azadi also says that she has access to modeling software uh, provided by the state, which can like model how we can adjust our zoning codes to comply with the MBK Communities Act. And she says that she's really struggling to find a way in which Waltham can have 4,000 units of housing close to transit. Um, which, I mean, once again, this is not a, a knock against her. You know, she's probably just learning how to use the software. I don't know how this software works. I'm sure I would, would not use it either. But Waltham currently has 4,000 of unit, 4, units of housing close to transit. Um, so here, right, you can see over 2,000 units of housing within a half mile of our commuter rail station um, at a density of greater than 15 units per acre. This is what currently exists in Waltham. Um, and then if we just go a little bit wider, we can see that, boom, we have 4,000 units of housing um, that is half of which is within a half mile of a commuter rail station and its density is above 15 units per acre. Um, the problem, of course, is that the NBA TA Community Act requires us to legalize housing and all the housing that currently exists in Southside is illegal to build nowadays because we have dumb zoning laws. Exclusionary zoning laws would be the more accurate term. And everything in Southside was built prior to the 1950s when these zoning laws were created, or at least most of it was. Um, yeah, this isn't to say like, the reasonable just... course of action would be to just legalize what we already have. That would be bad. That wouldn't do anything to improve affordability in Waltham. All it would do is make it slightly easier um, for like currently existing housing to be refurbished or like flipped. Like I'm not saying that's what we should do to comply, comply with MBTA Communities Law, but any any time like the city acts like this is like a super onerous thing for the state to require of us, it isn't. Um, because we already have transit-oriented development. It doesn't make Southside a horrible place to live. Southside is wonderful. I love it. It is the beating heart of Waltham. Um, and this is this, we just have to build more of this to comply with the MBTA Communities Law. Or we just have to legalize more of this to comply with the MBTA Communities Law. It's not like and, a crazy place. And, it, and it, um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, we don't have to build 4,000 units in... Uh, near transit we only have to build 2,000 units near transit and then the other 2,000 units can be built anywhere in Waltham yeah, or you so know both, legalized to be zoned in Waltham those those units yeah so both by land area and by units of housing legalized um at least 50 percent yeah of the new zoning has to be within a half mile of commuter rail station yeah. Which is what this describes. We have like a little over 2,000 of it within a half mile and the remaining 2,000 just outside that. Yeah. Yeah. So some and, counselors are saying, you know, think about what a 3,800 unit uh, building is going to look like. That's not that's not what this is talking about at all. No, no, not at no, all. They're making it sound like they're going to have like eight foot build or eight, eight story buildings like everywhere as a result of this. And like. It, it, you, you mentioned that we already have transit-oriented development. Like that, this was all the, like most of this downtown Waltham area was developed as a streetcar suburb, and we should definitely put like the map of that in, like what that looked like. Mm -hmm. But like, it, like this is just like requiring them to undo the zoning that they did in the '50s or whatever that made it so that you couldn't build dense housing anymore because you need to have minimum parking and all the extra, all the set, setbacks and stuff like that, and. 
you know, it's we just need to make Southside legal again. Like Southside has so much dense multifamily yeah. housing. It's the most affordable housing that there is in Waltham. And we need more of that dense affordable housing, uh, which is what the NBJ Communities Act will incentivize us to do. It's of course up to Waltham how they choose to implement this. They can choose to implement it well or they can choose to implement it poorly. Um, but regardless of how well Wal our city council does in implementing this, like it's not an onerous ask. It's just asking us to build more of what we already have or just legalize more of what we already have. One thing related to this that um, I thought was funny was the um, our MBTA Communities Action Plan was accepted by the state. And I think one of the things that was on that action plan was re referring to like the ongoing work that was being done related to like improving the zoning and stuff in the city. And it, in that list was like the master plan and I think the bus shelters. And I noticed that the bus shelters on Moody Street are like in the budget hearings were getting approved and like getting, and that was going to be coming a thing. I can't have, help but wonder if like the MBT Communities Act sort of lit a fire under the ass of the people to get this stuff done in, in a reasonable time because it was going nowhere for a while. I think Paz had introduced the Moody Street bus shelter thing years ago. Oh yeah, that's the first thing he ever did. What was that? And I remember Mick was like, ever did. <laughs> yeah, and Mick McMinniman was referring to it as like uh, the Methadone Mile or and analogizing it to Methadone Mile, like yeah. with like the things you would see. And now here we are getting them approved. Yeah, I wish I wish we had our show back then. They would definitely would have been mm -hmm. talked about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So Tom, just I'm just looking for your prediction. What part of Waltham is going to be uh, affected the most uh, by by this? Do you think it'll be Weston, Warrendale, or uh, Brandis Roberts, or Felton Street? I think those are the four spots. So that's a good question because I so what we know is that our current city council hates new housing, um, and they vaguely claim, even though it's like refuted by all like empirical evidence, they vaguely claim that they don't want new housing because because it will harm our low income renters. All evidence says it's the opposite. More housing means people have more places to live. Uh, regardless, that is what they claim. So if they truly believe that and they just think they're doing the right thing by our lower income renter population by restricting new affordable housing. Um, they'll probably just like legalize what we already have and then it'll all get redeveloped and stuff will suck. Um, <laughs> however, hmm. actually, no, that's a lie. Okay. I, I, I take back putting those words in their mouth because um, maybe they don't want uh, by that logic, maybe they don't want um, Southside changed and they're just going to cram all the housing along Felton Street. Regardless, what I hope happens, what I would like to happen, yeah, let's start I want predictions. What I want to happen is that I would love to just have a bunch of dense housing along Felton Street in all these industrial areas. Like, we shouldn't be having heavy, polluting industry right in between our densest populated area of Waltham and our most treasured natural resource, the Charles River. We shouldn't have dense, heavy polluting industry right in the middle of those two things. Um, Felton Street should be a nice residential or mixed use corridor. Um, that's a great place to put dense housing. Whenever you add dense housing next to existing neighborhoods rather than replacing existing neighborhoods, you're not displacing anyone. And the vast, like the great, you get the greatest amount of increased housing which will lower rents for everyone else. Um, it'll mean that's a lot of dense building, which means you get the maximum, you get the maximum bang for your buck in, buck in terms of inclusionary zoning. You get a lot of income restricted affordable housing out of that. I really hope they just build a lot of dense housing along Felton Street. If they just cram it all along there, I think that's the best thing. Um, but that's just my like amateur. Opinion. I would, yeah. I, I, I hope that they, I hope they turn the Brandeis Roberts T station into something more, but I think that's not definitely not going to be in the cards until they get more services out there, like supermarket, at least one supermarket or something. Mm -hmm. But like, uh, just like increase it, like like increasing like the the density along that strip of Felton and even on the other side of the river where Cronin's Landing and on would be nice to see. But like, it, it is like bizarre to have an industrial area persist like this along like such a high value stretch of land and it really ma makes you question why that would stay that way if it unless it was to prevent development for housing 
which is really what it looks like. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, McMinimum has been very explicit about that in the past, actually. McMinimum has been very explicit that, like, she that was what she hated about the Edison on the Charles, this development right here in the chemistry. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what she hated about. She's like, ah, oh, it should stay industrial, right in between yeah. the Charles River and the densest parts of Waltham. Like, and, and, the, and the bit in the central commuter rail station of the city, mm -hmm. <laughs> which, and, like, on the subject of, like, polluting industry stuff in the middle of like residential areas it's like you've got the um you know things like all, all, the, all this automobile infrastructure stuff like um uh car washes uh mechanics and all this type of stuff located in this area right here too that is just like they talk about like how much of an issue it is parking and things like that and a lot of these industries like companies are leaving their cars that they're working on all over all the streets in the city like it's a very common practice i've lived near uh mechanics that are doing that do that would literally leave it in the, the lot right next door to the place that i live in until it started getting redeveloped and what, what this turns into is like you, you've got this commercial land use of the free public parking spaces that are provided to everyone and then that's getting used as an excuse to not want more residential people like more residential use of the land it's just a very it's, you know it's, it's it's very it's a very frustrating uh line line of argument to engage with mm -hmm. yeah i'm curious uh because of how most of the city councilors view housing and new housing and their philosophy of housing i'm curious if they push what they view as bad onto the south side or if they push it onto Weston or Warrendale, um, which historically has held more affluent um, neighbors. Um, and so I'm very curious to see how it goes. I would guess Brandeis Roberts looks very different, um, but I know very little about all this. Anything else on this, Tom? I guess it is worth saying that like four of our city councilors live in wards or no three of our city councilors plus the mayor live in ward seven mm -hmm. uh i'm not sure if that would maybe like mm -hmm. hear a lot of their constituents i know a lot of their constituents are like not on the south street side of ward seven they're mm -hmm. in yeah. the warrendale side of things, I, I, I don't i don't i don't think that it's a coincidence that if you look at the ratio of the densities surrounding these t stations that the one with the 0.2 density or whatever versus like you know the goal of being 15 units per acre is the one that has the mayor and multiple city councilors all living in close proximity of it like it does, you're probably right i think that i think that area has not been developed with good reason because that's where a lot of the people that have a lot of strings of power tend to congregate mm -hmm. but uh stop sharing your screen oh yeah yeah uh, yeah, and then just the last two things I wanted to mention about this is uh, Solicitor Azadi also said that um, um, a problem with this is that um, the city is not allowed to require mixed use development. They aren't allowed to require commercial development in these areas. It has to be where, like, the only thing that's actually, um, like, if someone wants to build only residential, you should, you, the city has to let them build only residential. You aren't allowed to add all these bells and whistles to make it harder to build housing. Uh, so, be, so because of that, whenever uh, there's, she's expressed some concern that like we aren't able to legalize, we aren't allowed to mandate that like things like grocery stores are built in these areas. Um, and to that, I just like to say like a, this is an area where Fulton Street. You're within a 15 minute walk of multiple grocery stores already. Uh, both the ones on Moody Street, uh, the Dispensa Familiar by the Common, and also Hannaford. Uh, and also just the fact that, like, um, developers will probably build grocery stores if you have 4,000 people right there. Um, there. There keeps on being this, like, ridiculous assumption that, like, the reason we don't have, like, more housing or, like, the reason we don't have affordable housing or the reason we don't have, like, grocery stores uh in like certain areas is because that is just like a choice that people make um just like in the but it's not a choice it's something that's enforced by the city council you know the city council has made it illegal to build dense affordable housing in most of waltham 
city council has made it illegal uh, to build grocery stores near where people mm. actually live. So that way, you know, it's impossible to walk to a grocery store. Like these aren't choices that people are making. This is something that city council has forced. And once we start allowing people to actually live in more places, um, and if we just, you don't have to force people, to, you don't have to force developers to build a grocery store. If you make it legal for 4,000 people to live in a specific area, there's no way a developer is not going to hop on that money and mm. grab a grocery store. And this isn't me singing the praises of developers. This is just how the greed works, you know? Yeah. Um, is it morally just? No. But like, you can still just read the tea leaves and be like, okay, this is how it's going to work. And that's fine. It definitely just makes it look, highlights just how short-sighted a lot of this like posturing against housing has been. Mm -hmm. Like... Um, it's basically bottlenecked a lot of the development that could otherwise be happening here, especially by like not being able to qualify for grants and things like that, by not being like you know in compliance with like the, it, it, yeah, it's it's. You go, you can go ahead, Chris. Sorry. No, um, I was just trying to remember exactly where we are with MBTA's Communities Act. Where, uh, Tom, do you, do you can you enlighten us on that? Okay, yeah. So with that being said. Um, the last thing mentioned in that meeting was that we we're just going to set it aside for now um, while I guess they work on more like potential zoning possibilities behind the scene. But I think they floated the idea of having a public input session sometime around the month of September, uh, which is mandatory because anytime you propose zoning changes uh, in a city government, a necessary step for zoning changes is you have to hold a public hearing about it. So that is going to happen. They floated the idea of September. Um, so if that's the case, um, that's probably the next thing we'll definitely be like organizing around, or at least me as a part of Waltham Inclusive Neighborhoods. We'll be looking forward to like, A, getting more details on what exact plans they choose to take to um, abide by the MBTA Communities Law, and B, organizing to actually show up and you know have our word to say that, yes, the Waltham needs more housing. We are in a dire housing shortage right now. Another well attended meeting for sure. Looking forward to that. Um, so 